Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, thrilled to be here uh, today. Um, oddly enough, I'm in fashion, so they pick me for the presentation thing. How superficial are these people? Um, anyway, with us today, we have three um, most excellent women. Um, we have a uh, fashion pioneer, Beth Ann Hardison, Alexander Leventhal, who's the president of Leventhal and Company, and Joy Gar Gordon, Garden. You have a joyous garden. Joy Gordon, CEO of Dress for Success. Um, and she also, by the way, runs a luxury limo company. I just read this and I'm really impressed. <laughs> and uh, so come. And they all look really successful. Look at them. They're radiating power. They really are. Hang on, good. All your colors are totally working together. <laughs> Aren't you relieved? Um, so. I mean, you know, I think we all often ask ourselves, is presentation everything? And I think that many people uh, might say yes, but it is, of course, a yes uh, by degrees. Do we, do we not want to project confidence uh, above all? Whether your confidence comes from the words you choose, your body language, the new pair of shoes um, you have. And, and when you look at recent events like the presidential campaign in the past week, um, you can, we can all see how much, say, a failure in presentation can impact one's chances of winning. And uh, when it comes to our professional lives, are we all running individual campaigns? Um, how much presentation matters depends on your playing field. For example, an industry dominated by men, finance, uh, versus an in industry dominated by women, fashion. In science versus the arts, if you're at the beginning of your career versus consolidating your career. So all three of these women all have very different stories to tell because um, they represent you know, three very different in industries, industries, fashion, non-profit and finance. And they have different stories to tell about how they've presented themselves, what works and what doesn't in their respective industries. So, hi ladies. Hello. Hi. Um, you know what, I'm Alexandra. I'm gonna start with you um, because uh, finance rock star here and wearing an amazing dress, which I've been complimenting her on girlishly in the back. Um, what you know, the prevailing cliche, and I'm going to address this just for a second because I think it's really gotten old. But um, in the financial industry, is that men rule the roost and women have to dress and act like them to succeed? Um, how do you balance that cliche against running a real world business? Does it occur to you or not? Um, and what preconceptions have you come against, come up against, if any, um, in your own career? It's a it's a great question. I am on. Uh, I think that there are a lot of um, misperceptions about how women on Wall Street can dress, should dress. It may be a little bit different for me because I have always worked at my own company. Uh, I did actually sell our company and for four years worked for other people and um, did actually for a time uh, get a little bit self-conscious because I understood that some of the gentlemen were comp uh, commenting on my clothes and shoes and so I decided to actually turn the tables on them and every time I used to have to go to dreadful, excuse me if anybody's from there, Hartford, Connecticut, <gasps> I would go and buy a new pair of Prada shoes um, or Manolo's or a new suit or bag just to say yes, I, I am taking you know every liberty with my clothing. But um, <laughs> I love being able to look great in a man's world and I think that men actually notice and I think that they somehow get a sense that you're a little bit more confident, um, perhaps a little bit more uh, able when you walk into a room and you look great and when you don't wear a black suit and you don't wear a brown dress. Um, and I think that presentation matters in finance uh, just as it does in any, any industry at all. And I actually will tell you that in thinking about this today, I wanted to come looking like I do during the day. So uh, even though it's a Sunday, I... No day of rest for this no one. No day of rest. <laughs> Actually, I was in J. Crew about two hours before <laughs> I got here coming in from the country, but uh, I, I thought I would wear an outfit that I would wear as if I were going to a meeting where I would be one of, if not the only woman in the room and make sure that all of the men in the financial world would say, who is that tiny little woman <laughs> in, in those bright colors? We're, we're sort of um, you know, taken aback by it. And so this is, this is what I would wear to a day I on have Wall Street. A, yeah, I have a friend, she works at Goldman, and um, very attractive, um, you know, very striking tall girl. And she wears a black suit. 
She has amazing, beautiful hair. She slicks her hair back in a low bun and wears a, a shift dress. And I always say to her, why, why do you have to dress like that? And she said, it's too hard otherwise. It's too hard if she doesn't. And what do you say to that? That, it makes me sad. I know. Because yeah. particularly if you work in the world of finance, chances are you actually have um, more wherewithal to uh, to buy lovely clothing and, and to stand out and to, to be styled. I actually heard that there are certain very successful women at major investment banks that hire stylists to make them not stand out. And I didn't think you needed that's, that's a tragedy. money for that. Um, but I think for a woman, <laughs> if you feel like you can't shift from a black suit to a bright red suit, then you can start by adding some great jewelry or great shoes. And it kind of gives you the ability to take baby steps, um, as it were, in, in testing out how you can embrace your own personal style. I will say one of the things also that happens sometimes when I do speak is that younger women come up to me and say, how should we be dressing? Is this okay, you know, with the way we are now? And, and I was talking at Morgan Stanley last year and two young women came up and said that and they were, they just graduated from college. And I said, you know, you can't come to work tomorrow dressed like me. It won't look <laughs> right, it won't fit you. So start slowly evolving. And I will tell you actually, somebody who was a great role model for style for me, who I assume you know, Valerie Salambier. Sure. Uh, who was the, the former, former publisher, of, publisher Bazaar. Of, of Bazaar, who I met when I was in my early 20s. And she used to wear great big earrings and, and you know bold shoes. And I thought, I want to be like her. But it wasn't until I was in my late 30s, early 40s that I felt like I could pull that off. So I sort think... Sort of get your mojo, don't you? I think yeah. definitely. It takes some, takes some years. It's one of the advantages of aging. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joy, you, you run a, um, an organisation that literally exemplifies this philosophy. You know, uh, presentation is dress for, success, dress for success. Presentation is everything that is sort of the idea. Can you tell us about how Dress for Success was founded, um, the need it serves, and the most immediate results that are so gratifying to you? Great. So kind of a show of hands. Who's heard of Dress for Success? Oh. <laughs> Winner! <laughs> I know. Exactly. Um, so thank you for for knowing our organization. Um, I would say 16 short years ago in the city, there was a young law student by the name of Nancy Loveland who got an inheritance from her great granddad for $5,000. And maybe because she was young, maybe because she hadn't worked before, but she really did believe with $5,000 she was gonna change the world. And, um, and she's quite frankly done just that. We today have 126 offices in 13 countries. And it started right here in New York City um, with one woman's belief that she could change the world. Um, and, and I say she is the smartest woman I've ever met, but I have to say that I am so grateful that if the organization's been around 16 years, 15 and a half of those years ago, I was a, an assistant district attorney, I was a prosecutor in the courts, and I was smart enough to be listening to the news in the morning and saw this young woman sitting on a couch talking about how she just started this organization that gave suits to women who needed them. And I thought, easy enough, I'll donate a suit. Well, I went from suit donor to board member, because she needed a lawyer on the board, to a year later deciding I was gonna leave what I was doing and I was gonna work in that basement of the church because I so completely got it that that suit for many women was a symbol of success. And so the reality is, for many of us in this room, we've worn suits before, but over 50% of the women who walk through our doors have never owned a suit. And so if you can just imagine the first time putting on a suit, the first time looking in the mirror, the first time seeing someone whom you've never seen before, somebody you've always wanted to be, and having that person look back at you and, and, and immediately embodying what that suit means, which is success. And so I've often said that the best accessory, honestly, is not the jewelry you wear or the shoes you wear, but the confidence you wear. That's the best accessory. And so we really suit women from the, the inside first. You know, I know that people's perception of us is about the clothing, but what we do is so much more than suit her up and let her leave. Um, it's the work we do to prepare her to wear the suit, the work we do when she's now searching for a job, the work we do when she fails or believes she fails at finding work. 
and the work we do after she lands a job so that she remains employed. And we know that how you look matters, of course. Um, and whether it's fair or not, people judge you based on the way you look, fair or not. Um, but I'm so grateful that this young woman decided that this was where she was going to put her $5,000 because it really has changed the world. That bought her entry to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, no, I'm curious though, how, how, in terms of, because I think we do think of just success, it's like suits you up and, and prepares you uh, mentally, but I'm, just briefly, if you could expand on what you do after the job has been gotten. Absolutely. So we run a number of programs. Um, we run programs while she's job searching. So she comes in, she gets the suit, she doesn't land the job which is the reality now. It wasn't when we started this organization. Almost everybody was landing jobs. They're not now. Um, and so we work with her over a 12-week period while she's still job searching, giving her the tools, the support, the confidence, uh, the push she needs to continue the, to wage the war on employment, right? Um, when she lands her job, we then have her in what we call the professional women's group. She goes to monthly meetings, workshops, we have a mentorship program, and then we have a leadership conference like this, where we take one woman from around the globe, 124 women, all expense pay, and put them through a leadership series. And so the, the work is, and we talked about this, you go to these conferences and you're so excited and you go back and you're fired up and you want to do something, but you don't know where to start. Well, they have a community action project, so they have to do something in their community. They have to make a difference. The same women who came to dress for success because they needed a suit and needed a job become leaders in their communities and have transformed not only their own life, but how people perceive them, not as a handout, right? No more, right? So that's the kind of work that Dress for Success is doing. And it really is no longer about the clothing. Certainly, she doesn't get it. She thinks she's coming in for a brand new suit, and that's how we draw her in. But from there, <laughs> It's about giving her really the tools she needs to succeed. I mean, what's so remarkable about Dress for Success is how quantifiable it is. Right. You know what I mean? Because we were talking earlier, there's lots of times women can go around and talk about ourselves. We've got to do this, and wouldn't this be great if this changed? And, and, and then leave and sort of forget about it. But um, you guys never did forget about it, so congratulations. <laughs> um, Beth Ann. Yes. Hello. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, Beth Ann, um, you know, you. I would, we're friends here. Yes. We can, yeah. um, you've conquered an image-driven business, mm -hmm. and uh, you can speak to quite literally how looks matter. Uh, but in terms of the way of presenting yourself, what impact do the other qualities have of presentation, you know, uh, have on a successful career? Having a, say that again? Having, if you're having a successful career in fashion as, as a model or as a, what do, obviously it's a looks-driven business, but what do the other qualities, you know, what are the other qualities that are so key to you? Well, you know, it's interesting you say, and you talk about, clothing and how one looks and you know when you come up in an industry that you came into so long ago when we didn't have all the accessories you have now when you don't have all the passion for labels we never had that before everyone either had style or they didn't you know <laughs> it's more important Darwinian. About, yeah so it's, more, it's much more important to have a certain style i mean i was just saying today as i have to go to these different many places in the next few weeks Personally, I wish I could just wear one thing every day. Just one thing. And so I, lending to what you've said, it's very nice to be able to bid on a Manolo and be able to put on this and that. But the great thing about coming in an industry like mine where you're not judged because as a woman so much, is that you have to, if you have style and you don't have money, that's where you come. You have to bring it. You have to come with something that you have personally that means a lot to you. People notice style. You don't notice anymore, or I don't because I've seen so much of it. I'm overwhelmed by all the accessories, all the labels. Oh, I have, oh, you have this bag, that shoe. <laughs> it's very hard to figure it all out after a while. But the great thing about being in a business that you don't, you know, I always say when a model comes in for, for, for castings, when I, when I work with designers for castings, and you always hope that the girls look like we used to look back in the day, that they actually brought something to the table. They looked interesting. Even when they were the youngest, they should look like they have a clue about themselves. And the interesting thing about it, most of them don't. They come young, the, the agency, there's so many models nowadays, the agencies don't take the time to groom the girl like you know we had in the music business where you used to have you know, artist development, so to speak. They don't take that time. When we were coming up, there were less models to compete with, but you always picked up from the other girl. You saw what you were supposed to do. A designer took you under his wing and started to dress you a little bit and put things together. So those things are very nice to have, the appearance, but the drive is the most important thing, that drive that you need to sort of like get yourself up every day and go out there and not even care about what you're wearing as long as you remember your 
you're, you know, you're, you're focused on what you need to do, what you want to get to. And I think what's so important about our industry, because now it's changed so greatly, it's not my cup of tea per se, but what it really is is that it's something we do all live in and it is not a man's world. But even though it's corporately owned, it does sort of affect you, you know, because you see what's happened to us. You see how it, it's sort of like controlled by advertisers and all. And out. now everyone thinks if their daughter is skinny, it's because it's our fault. You know that. Mm -hmm. It is our fault. And it's not. It's, it's all your fault. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yes, yes, I'm sorry. Specifically. So, so, yes, specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody who ever represents a model or even gets a model, that's exactly right. So the fact of it is, is that it is a lot of things that we do besides have that, you know, what do you look like? It is your personality, no, no matter what. If you have a sense of, you know, style, it's more important than anything. But really, it's, it's, it's really having a clue about what industry you're in and knowing about your business so you know how to compete with the next person. That's what I think more. You know what's interesting, too, and having been, I've, you know, I've been in magazines for a while. And, and, but, you know, it's a very strange way being in the fashion industry itself, deep in the fashion industry, can have almost a desensitizing effect on stuff. To your point, there's so many accessories, so many labels. And... It just, it just becomes, after a while, when you're lucky enough to be inside it and you've had a nice pair of shoes, and you know what I mean, and, that, and that's great, but because there's not so much of a myth about it, in a way, a lot of people have this, uh, this idea that yeah. editors and agents or whatever were you know, walking around and obsessing about it all day. Yeah. Uh, no, you, you pay attention, but do you find that too, that one day you woke up and you're like, it's, it's nice stuff, but it's just stuff? Yeah, well, absolutely. That's the reason why I live halfway in Mex Mexico. That's the reason why I travel and travel to Morocco. I mean, it's because you have to get away from the, you know, the, the, the sound of the drumbeat here. Just remember that there's much more to life called culture. And the people who have less are the people who you seem to appreciate, that they seem to appreciate things more. They're happier. You know, I, you know oftentimes when I work, and I, I'm sort of going to restaurants, and I always give a great deal of energy to service people. But I noticed one time a girl told me that worked at, one of the Chanel stores, and that that's the toughest job ever because the people, the women, are so mean. I mean, they really get mad when that bag didn't come in. They really get pissed off when the shoe. Well, it's didn't an outrage. Run. I mean, it's really. I mean, the anger, the rudeness, the. the you know, it's it's. <laughs> yeah. Need a baby. I mean, perspective. Hello. Um, so, um, Alexander, you you touched on this um, a little bit, but I want to ask all of you how. Um, you grew into, how, you know, into how you, where you present yourselves now. And to your point, I, I know that in my age now, you know, 26, um, <laughs> no, that, that you kind of get more comfortable with your style and, and you understand. So when did, it, when did you feel like you, you clicked it? Uh, I don't know that I could say exactly when it was, but I had the ben great benefit of being only three blocks away from Century 21 for much... <laughs> much of my career <laughs> so uh we women and i from work used to go in there and peruse around and i think the access and i think that's one thing that's been great is the access to designer labels um and actually i will just say i used to go to lomans with my mother we used to take the subway up to fordham road and and yeah. she taught me a lot about that but but i think that that um access to inexpensive yet great clothing made a difference. Um, you know, it's funny, I think it's still evolving to a certain extent. I just cut my hair a year ago from down here because uh, I wore it in a ponytail every day and I thought, well, you know, at age 47, you probably should look a little bit more like a grown-up. Uh, so I think that does change over, t over time. Um, I, I do, I was so struck by what you said and I do think that if you have a great outfit on, it doesn't matter if you don't feel great about yourself <laughs> and you don't come into a room with a sense of self mm -hmm. and a sense of style that isn't just about what you wear. It's a sense of style about how you view life, how you treat other people, thanking people, sending notes, following up on everything, not looking at your Blackberry while somebody's talking <laughs> to you. Um, you know, so, so many things that I think we take for granted today in a world that is just so, so fast-paced fast. so, yeah. um, and, and moving so quickly. And, and you see sort of, uh, just coming off Fashion Week here, and you see fashion sort of desperately used by so many people to get attention and for all the wrong reasons. And you just sort of look at those sort of preening people wanting to be, you know, shot by a street star photographer and just kind of wince. You know what I mean? Nice. And just go like, oh, girl. Well, and the other thing down. that is you know? funny about yeah. that scene outside is that the, the 
street photographers, bloggers don't seem to know what they're looking for per se. And if one person is having their picture taken, all of a sudden they come like ducks (laughs) in. And they're all taking pictures of the same... Yeah. They're yeah. yeah. like, oh, she's yeah, yeah. she's wearing Celine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Joy, so tell me, is that how you, you know, got to got to feel your, you know, your own personal, personal style. style groove? My, uh, I guess my personal brand, and just <laughs> I don't even know. Nancy Lublin, is she in here? I s- turned around and saw our founder walk into the room, and I thought, oh my oh. god, I, you can be in New York City and and not see someone for years, and so it was just great to just see her walk in the room. Um, it's very funny. Her style is so different from my style, and we were like the yin and yang address for success. She was more casual, um, and I was more suited, and that was largely because I came out of uh, law, and so you know I wore a suit every day, and I would uh, literally go from Queens to the Bronx in a suit, and anybody who got off the train at 161st Street in a in a suit had to be a lawyer. So it's just like, why would you be walking on 161st Street in the South Bronx in a suit? And so the suit became my signature. And um, and it's very much a part of who I am. I I think I I typically am very conservative. Um, And, you know, Today my hair is pulled back. Though. Yeah, no, it's a little Just trying saying. to go a little right, but uh, <laughs> but my hair is pulled back because I was at Great Adventures in the rain last night, not because I didn't want to wear my hair out. Um, but you know, it's part of my, it's kind of part of my brand. And even on the weekends, I kind of find it difficult to to scale it down. Um, and and when I try or when I'm not at my best, my kids are like, "Where are you going?" Like, that is awful, right? <laughs> you might see someone who knows you, and it always happens, right? You're at Costco, you're like, oh, God, yes, I'm just going to run in, get a couple items. And they're like, oh, my God, dress for success. And you're just like, yes. <laughs> you're like, looks don't matter today. Right. You're like, oh, right. Uh, that's why I need I, to keep I wear it my up. success on the inside. Absolutely. <laughs> and you, you don't know. I mean, just coming to a meeting and dress for success, both men and women, people are, what do I wear? You know, these are corporate executives thinking about, you know, how do they put their success forward and how they look. And so it does matter. And uh, that my, you know, I couldn't have found a better place to, to give my, be a, be a leader in an organization that is about wearing suits and dressing for success and, um, and embodying that and then portraying it to the women we serve um, and helping them understand the importance of how they look. Beth Ann, yes. the ever stylish Beth Ann. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think it's now that it is most people gain a certain amount of understanding about what to wear when they get older. I seem to care less about it all <laughs> as I get older. When I was younger, you know, we had a great time in New York. You know, the 60s were great, the 70s were great. You know, we could rock it. We could do anything we want. We were out there, you know, wearing no underwear and long dresses. <laughs> you, know, you know, just it was just genius to be so full of um, personality and clothing. It's really wonderful. But once something becomes so saturated, as you said, it seems to me it's so different now. It just is so much. It's so much to do about nothing. To me, I lose the, the interest in it. But you know, personally, you can't help but always want to have. You have too many clothes in your closet. You see that. You see that you've gone too far. You can't seem to edit it as well as you used to. You long to go away so you can get sort of like simplified. You always come back with a little bit from another country, a little bit of more inspiration of something. That's the stuff that I like the most. I really enjoy um, the freedom of seeing what other people do and bring it home, more so than doing what we do and trying to keep up. I, I, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not what's happening. One thing I want to keep up with is what you talked about and you said that I mentioned, is learning to be gracious, you know, trying to teach everyone that I know to be smarter, smarter about how to get over. So if you're going to win, win by competing with that girl who doesn't even have a clue about being gracious or being smart, being how to know how to sort of like write that note. That's the style I look for, how to sort of like be thoughtful about everything you can think of how to beat the other person, because the other person is busy on their Blackberry, they're texting, they're looking and they're going on Facebook, they have a lot of things they have to answer to, they've got a lot of people to tell what they're doing. If you could just outsmart, that's why I tell all the kids I work with, if you could just outsmart them by learning how to at least cook something. You know, you want a man, just one thing, just you want one. a man, but you don't know how to cook. Mm-hmm. And that to me is a lot of style. Right, right. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> So it's, writing that down. Yeah, yeah, I've got to go cook yeah, something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so in a way, as I, I sort of touched, you know, it's like your own sort of personal campaign. So just to do it, you know, an hour before I open it up to questions, um, a bit of a pivot. 
um, to the presidential campaign. Oh, yes. Because um, that's so juicy. It's um, so much fun. If each of you had to give advice uh, on presentation to one or both, perhaps one more than the other, who knows, um, <laughs> on, on, on the campaign, what would you say to them? Alexander. Well, politics can be a dangerous topic to get into, but I think the, <laughs> the question of presentation is everything. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, um, man, Obama's really got some great style and <laughs> commands an audience. <laughs> and, you know, the, the late night shows have just had a field day over the last number of months with his singing versus Romney singing great America the Beautiful. <laughs> I think, though, th that the most important thing, and this applies to all of us, is think before you speak. Yes. <laughs> think about how people are going to perceive what's coming out of your mouth. And it just is so tragic to see Romney time after time again. I mean, this is a smart guy who's done some very successful things, who's run on, you know, the Olympics and a state and companies. And, and if his campaign is based on that, unfortunately, um, he hasn't shown us that, so. I don't want to lock him inside. I know, I, I know, <laughs> and just say, dude, come on, <laughs> get it together. It's not yeah. over yet. Yeah. You, can, you can still at least redeem yourself slightly. I'm sure Paul um, Ryan says, dude. <laughs> and, and Paul Ryan, don't lie about your marathon time ever, ever, ever. ever. For yeah. those of us who have run marathons, I mean, you know to the second, you know, let the alone second. the hour. And it's you a world also, of and, lies. And you also know that to run under three hours is really quite remarkable. Yes. Um, He's a six million dollar man. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's just it's just kind of sad. It, it'll. I mean, it's not over yet. We'll see what happens. Um, but uh, I guess Romney should be taking a lesson from Obama here. Mm -hmm. and, and not in singing. Learn to nothing sing can a fix that. Better. Uh, joy. <laughs> Thoughts. Well, I think. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, yes. um, I think you know. Authenticity, right? So you want to be authentic. And I think that is the difference in what we're seeing is authenticity, integrity. It's, it, that's the style I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone I, I look at and I instantly start to believe in what they say to me personally. And, um, and I'm not certain. I think the candidates are completely different, obviously. And um, it's up to us, right, to determine who we believe. And so I'm looking for authenticity. I'm looking for integrity. I'm looking for someone I trust. Um, that's the style I want to see. That's who I want okay. to be my commander in chief, right? And that's what I'm hoping for okay. um, in the next several years. Okay, now let me ask you something. Yes. As you say that. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no, no. I it's your turn anyway. Yes. Get in there. Get in oh, there. No, I was just going to say, as you say that too, because she's. Oh, sorry. So glad you're there. <laughs> um, you know, the interesting thing about that is that as you asked, what would we actually you know, suggest to them. Mm -hmm. You see this, notice that each one of you got so passionate about, you know, how you felt about the campaigns, and you didn't answer your question, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want honesty. She, she, want was, honesty. she was safe at the start, and then she went for it. Yeah, yeah, she went for it. Well, the interesting thing about that is because this is such a passionate moment right. now. This is really, and we're in New York, so it's much easier for us all to see things much clearer, but the rest of the country, you know, they, they really just are looking for someone to please, show me the way, right. and they don't really know who's the who. And the, the, all they know is their problem, and they hope that someone will tell them that they can fix it. So I think everything is about the presentation, because we are really talking to, you know, we're not the smartest puppies in the kennel when it comes down to politics, we Americans. We're not. We're not. That's a straight up fact. Because otherwise we wouldn't have made some of the mistakes, or we wouldn't just listen to what whoever tells us, whoever speaks last. So the thing of it is to me is presentation how you can sort of win something. I know now, as Castro said many years ago, the way an American president becomes president is how much money he has. Mm -hmm. And the fact of it is that's been proven now in the last, what, four, eight years now? 12 years, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. before. Yeah. So that's the hard thing about it. It's just you know, making a great presentation and hoping that some of those words stick. I'm dying to hear the questions in the audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, which was very strange, because I'm opening up for questions. <laughs> what synergy? And this lady in red. Yeah, so I, I just want to say to Joy, I think that Mitt Romney is being authentic. We're seeing it. Mm -hmm. 
And when he talked about the 47%, that was his authentic right. thought about right. Americans. Um, we, my question for you, address for success, with the current economy, are you seeing more um, working people coming to your organization yeah. that were formerly working? Absolutely. And have you had to change the mission of Dress for Success? That's a very um, interesting question. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, heart, what breaks your heart is, is that there are women who are walking into our doors who are saying, you know, when I was at X, XYZ Bank, um, I conducted the suit drives for Dress for Success. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in my synagogue or in my church, this is what I've done for many years, and I've been working, and I've now been unemployed for over 30 months, right? So now mm -hmm. I'm in foreclosure, right? I had a home. I don't have a home. Um, I'm borderlining becoming homeless. So, yes, I'm seeing a lot of women. You know, I think when, when Nancy created this organization, she created an organization that's for all women, right? Of course, it was focused on the disadvantaged women, but it was for any woman. And so it has become the organization for all women to walk through the doors and being treated with dignity and respect. And I think for some, it's difficult to label yourself as disadvantaged. So we are actually talking about the word mm -hmm. disadvantaged. And maybe it's leaving some women from coming to our door because they're not willing to, to take that that label on because of where they are, because they were working, because they were providers, because they have a level of education. And so we are talking about what Dress for Success really needs to be for any woman who needs the organization. Wow. And then the second question I had for you and Bethann, hair. Hair is such a big deal in the black community, especially in corporate America, if you want to wear natural hair. No. What can you speak to you about that? And are you seeing changes with that? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because we both, I was pointing to you because I was thinking corporate, but you're not in corporate business uh -huh. per se anymore. Uh -huh. It's interesting. Um, that was that debate once. You know that happened uh -huh. where the, the woman went to, um, to a financial uh, office to talk to women about their hair and how to present themselves. And, and she honestly said that if you wore an afro, it would probably leave you in a position of not getting the job or not being, not so much getting a job, but being you know, advanced in your position. And that became a big, awful thing that, you know, it, it hit people wrong. It's like, how dare you say that? But I guess if she had been of color, maybe if I stood there and said that, they would have said, oh, wow, Bethany, you think so? Mm. But being she was of different color, it made a difference. I think that you could do anything nowadays. I mean, everyone was always so impressed that I had you know, uh, dreads when I was in the, they were so, because no one had anybody, all in the street had dreads. So people were impressed. They said, oh, in your business you can do that? It was, you know, it's, it's a fashion business. Nobody's thinking about what you're doing. If you're doing a good job at something, they're interested in what you're doing. Well, but in corporate America, it's I different. have to see the difference between me with braids and me with no braids. And people now are being able to let, to, allowed to do it more. Is that what you're saying? No. I'm no, you're saying it's still very strict. Yeah. You still feel like that Goldman yeah. girl in the black suit? Yeah. 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 And is that from the perspective of other uh, women or men? No, the people in corporate America in hiring. Right. You don't see a lot of black are judging. people, very black people with their I'm just picturing to myself, if a woman came into my office, I don't think I would think about it that much. Yeah. I, I, I don't. No, I mean, we certainly don't. No. Yeah, not I, true. Not now, biz. Not it's true. interesting that I've never not thought true. about it. And if, Fascinating question. <coughs> Hello. <coughs> Speaking of cool hair. Yeah. <laughs> today we call is, it a fun bun. Today is my Nina Simone revolutionary <laughs> <laughs> day. Um, no, seriously. Um, what are three things, well, I want to hear from each woman. What is something that you put inside of your internal that is reflected in your external? So what's that? So if it's one thing in life, like you started eating bananas and you just started to see a different change, you started listening to different music, like what's that one thing you think really transformed your life or the way that you felt on the outside or looked on the outside that you put inside? I don't know if I framed That's that That's a right. very good, wow. hard question. Like a, could it be so like a spirit? For me, like a feeling? Could be. Yeah, or it could be anything. Be a fruit. Could be. <laughs> yeah, I love the fruit. <laughs> I love the fruit. Is, fruit is easier. I'll just quickly say, uh, for me, I'd say openness to be open to people and things. And I think that comes out of you and makes people open to you. And for me, I think it's passion. Just loving what you do, what you have on, where you're going, just embrace it. And that's something that I actually learned from my dad who I've worked with for the last 25 years. Um, passion is everything to me. Oh, thanks. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, excuse. excuse. Okay. Well, for me, I think it's because I, my love for people. I, and my love for people has helped me to understand that even those who don't understand what should be done right, my love for them makes me want to help them to understand what's right. So I think being a revolutionist, you think you have to be because you care about people. And that's, I think, what makes a difference for me. You know, caring to change the world, you know, you got to love people. That's a dig it. Oh, wow, that was, that was powerful, right? <laughs> so very similar to that, I am a person who gives. And I give of my, I am very engaged. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, but I also give of my time. And so I'm actively involved in the community. So I give so much that I have gotten so much back. And so it is what I pour deep. I also give a lot of money. I'm, I believe I am a philanthropist. Um, and I think the more you give, the more you get. And so it keeps my cup overflowing. I'm not just full, I am overflowing in the gift of giving. And on that note, I couldn't end it any better. You're all overflowing with awesomeness. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>